Thank you, Gil, and thank you all for coming out. It's always a treat for me to come back to the Institute, largely because I was 21 when I first set foot here. And some of you may well remember that John Wilson was then professor of Egyptology who taught one of the first courses I took. Well, the spring after I arrived in September, I was being 21, and I, or maybe 22 by that time, took off my shoes and walked barefoot down from Dorchester and 59th to Woodlawn to the Institute and stopped at the door and was putting my shoes on. 21-year-olds do that. At which point, Professor Wilson came along and said, no, no, Irene, you've got it wrong. You take your shoes off when you enter the holy ground of the Oriental <laughs> Institute. <laughs> So since then, I've had a long history in this place and one that I feel very indebted to in my own formation, in a French sense, my own intellectual formation. Now, in contemplation of what I would do with this talk tonight, I'm putting together something that did not become a book in 1997 when I was going to write it and did other things. But I wanted to, you to see that at a certain stage in one's life and career, one gets to the point where you can play with your audience, play with your own mind, play with your material in ways that one wouldn't have had courage to do. So I made up three titles and three title slides for you to see where I was in between issues before we get to the substance of my talk. The first one, of course, is the stila of of Naram Sin, Akkadian period, 2300 or so BC, on your left. And I purposely put in the lost stila of Hammurabi because there's a cast of it up in the galleries. And I want to remind you that it isn't really a law code, thanks to Martha Roth. It's really a lost stila. We can talk about it some other time when I want to talk about the second millennium if I've ever invited back again. But it is an important and iconic monument of ancient Mesopotamia, as is the stela of Naram Sin. Now, this was my second title page, and it had to do with the stela and the state. Again, monuments of power, but size matters. Because if you take a look at the cast of the stela of the Neo-Assyrian period of Esarhaddon at Harvard in the Semitic Museum, it's enormous. And if that's the first millennium and the stela of Hammurabi is second millennium, then one of the things I want you to know is that they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And my third title <laughs> had to do with the relationship between the stila as a, poly, a, a monument and a public monument made of stone, large in scale generally, and the small scale cylinder seals that are such an important part of the repertoire of production, both in economic artifacts, but also in artworks in the whole Mesopotamian sequence. Um, it took me a long time to get the right picture that I wanted for how you can hold a seal in your hand as distinct from the height of the um, stela of Hammurabi, which I hope you will explore as the evening goes on. Now, Mesopotamia was not the only culture that developed and used the independent slab of stone as a marker of a variety of, of events and places and people. I show you one typical example from China. Wherever the date is, there are a series of commemorative stele, one place that has so many of them, it's called the Forest of Stele. And for the Chinese sequence, What's important is that they tend to commemorate an individual or an event tied to history, but tied often to person. Now, many of you will know the stela of um, Kutamua, found by your own David Schoen at the site of Zindrali. And here, a number of events have happened around that stela, including, as you see on the left, a program of two years ago. And there, what has been emphasized is that the stela is adapted for a particular individual named on the stela and is commemorative of that person, known as a commemorative marker, as a funerary marker for somebody who is deceased. And in that way, the sequence can go pretty directly from various stele in other cultures, and particularly the Chinese and the Kutamua, to the 
tombstones that we know today by our vocabulary, but really do commemorate an individual by an inscription, sometimes by imagery, and is connected to the death of an individual and then the ongoing recognition of that individual. Now, if you were to define the term, there are some things that I would put into the category of stila and some things that I would not put in. I would not put in what we tend to call kudurus that we talked about at dinner at one point this evening that is known to be either boundary markers or markers of an in engagement or an agreement that is made permanent by the inscription of them in word and image and put often in a temple. What I'm talking about tonight has to do with political markers that are neither funerary nor um, entitlements, but rather have to do with the state. Now, from the Greek, they tend to be monuments established as erected, therefore vertical, tend to be taller than they are wide, tend to be decorated sometimes with both text and image, whether they are only on the front, front and back, or wrap around or on the sides. So you have variation in that respect. They're decorated with imagery that can be extremely important, erected in the public sphere as a public commemorative monument associated, I believe, and hope to persuade you tonight, with early state formation in Mesopotamia. And therefore, the monuments I'm going to stay with tonight are all of the third millennium BC, as the early state was in a phase of development. Now, if everything were perfect, I would start in the fourth millennium, where there's a plaque just outside on the second floor that illustrates the work of vase. That's my favorite piece of art in probably the whole Near Eastern sequence. On the right, attached to this period, which was characterized by major architectural construction, and you see on the right, the, uh, uh, the I mean on your left, the um, Anu Ziggurat Temple at the site of Uruk Warka, coexisting with the early development in the writing of text and notation systems, as well as what we would call anthropologically a three-tiered social hierarchy that had to do with leadership cadres of officials and the people down below as a way of marking the necessary authority structure that supports the apparatus of the state with all of the offices that it requires. And then, of course, it co-varies, I think, with the appearance of not just what one would call art because it's craft and made by humans, but special investment in a work that would fall into our category of art even today. With that in mind, I would love to be able to start with the work of vase because the three tiers of the vase itself, from plants and animals to people in the ritual sphere to the deity at the top, represents that same how shall I say, mnemonic device of a three-tiered social hierarchy of the Earth's production, human, and the divine that I think is replicated in the social sphere. But unfortunately, what we don't have is a major stila of the Warka Uruk period that I could bring into today's discourse. There is an image on your right that is called the Warka stila that shows a figure in a cap hunting lions and I could make an argument, if this were a lecture, about the Warka vase, or the stila itself, about the, the it hints that there was such a social hierarchy that included a high-status ruler in the Uruk period. But this stila does not reflect a textual base from which we could confirm that. So I am, therefore, going to point you toward the future. For the Uruk period, there are several fragments of stele that have been discovered in recent years but have never been published. And what you're seeing right now is an Iraqi colleague on your left who is kneeling down with a fragment, the depiction of which is um, on the whoop, whoop, shall we go? On, um, on your right, that seems to indicate the design that is on this fragment. If it turns out to be datable, because it doesn't have a good archaeological context to the Uruk period, then we'll have something to talk about. But for the moment, it is not really dated. Therefore, I move us to one of my other favorite 
works of the uh, moment, and that is the um, stela known as the stela of the vultures of the early dynastic period around 2500, uh, 2500 BC, the stela of Eanatum of Lagash, a particular and important city-state in southern Mesopotamia. Now, I show it precisely because one of the things the stela does, apart from a text that is written on both front and back of the freestanding stone, is to depict the particular deity of Lagash, Lingirsu, on the obverse, that is the front, and very slyly introduce the ruler on the back. If I'm right in this reading, then full marks go in the text to Lagash as having been victorious in a border dispute with the neighboring city-state to the north known as Uma. However, the king who presided over that battle is not on the front. In fact, in the text as well, Ningirsu is given credit for having both blessed the ruler and his army, but also then decreed the victory of Lagash over Uma, and is given pride of place on the front or the obverse of the monument. At the same time, however, if you take a look at the third register down from the top, where I hope you can see it, where my pointer is, there are two little feet. There is a man in a chariot in the second register, and a man in the first register taking the center of the monument that then has a pileup of naked bodies and vultures, which is why it got the name the Stila of the Vultures when it was discussed, discovered by the French in the early 20th century. If you take a look at the drawing of it, we've reconstructed it in such a way that the figure of the ruler, Eanatum, is probably in the bottom attending temple ritual where it is said in his inscription he spent the night in order to get the god's blessing for the battle he was going to undertake. At that point, the person in the second register who's wearing a helmet just like this um, is competent to win the battle precisely because we also have from Ur similar helmets associated with very high-end ruling individuals. And if he then moves from the second register to that same figure in the first register with a horde of similar figures who are part of his army treading on enemy, then this is the moment reading from the bottom to the top of the victory of Lagash over Uma, where the Uma people are then devoured by these vultures. But I wanted you to see something particularly insidious about the monument which is that slowly from what we can read on the bottom of a challenge down below to the probable ruler facing the opposite way because he's in the temple for the night and then marching in narrative into battle and being victorious in battle, by the end, in the upper high register, the ruler has taken central place and has in a way inserted himself into the hierarchy of the state as it is being founded and then developed throughout the process of the third millennium. When we move to the monument that Western art loves best, it is the great stela of Darum Sin, found at Susa and probably dated in the 23rd or 24th century BCE. It was found at Susa because it was taken as booty from Mesopotamia by a second millennium Elamite Iranian ruler. We had the privilege of having the stela at the Metropolitan Museum some 15, 20 years ago, as you see, and it was installed as if it was almost a devotional piece in a chapel in a church where saints were worshipped, and the image itself has been worshipped. Take a look at the scale of it with one of the curators at the Met standing to the right. Naram Sin himself is depicted facing his monument but mountain as a way, the hurdle, with his soldiers behind him and the enemies he's encountered at the right-hand side. One of the wonderful parts of having the stela in the U.S. when it was at the Met was that we were able to get in there and make a new drawing of it with some details that had never been noted before. And amongst them, I wanted you to see that I think there are three identical 
astral elements at the top of the stela, there are not three different elements, not stars, but rather suns as one can demonstrate them. And why were there three suns in the top of it? Well, one of the tropes that Naram Sin and other Akkadian rulers use in their texts is that in a single day, they were victorious over X, a, ter a terrible terrain and a people, which marks them as great heroes of prowess. So if you think of it rather as dawn, the zenith, the height of the sun, and the setting of the sun, I think that you have an indicator here that's important and not just three astral elements. As you see from Naram Sin as well, his soldiers flank him on your left, but his right, and going down your right, but his left, are the enemy of the Gutif to his east that are in various postures of humiliation as they fall off the mountain and as they then defer to the power of Naram Sin. Now, why do I show this in detail? For one thing, because Western art history almost always includes this monument. No matter how few Mesopotamian things are in the survey, you always get maybe one Gudea, the Stila of Naram Sin, and then the Lion Hunts of Ashurbanipal, um, because that's the way in which the West reads our heritage moving into Europe from the ancient Near East, which I have come to call West Asia for a variety of reasons you can ask me about later. But one of the reasons is that the body of Naram Sin is so beautifully articulated that I call him part of the beautiful boy, beautiful butt school of Greek art, and that we see our ancestors in Naram Sin in ways that led in a straight line to the, the Greek figures of sculpture, like the Critios boy of 480 BCE, that moves from the archaic into the classical period with that break in stance that moves his body forward rather than the earlier Greek statues that stood looking more like Egypt. Now that's also the point at which Naram Sin is on a direct line of heritage to Michelangelo's David, and I hoped you would laugh because it's not really vulgar. It means that there is a way in which he's seductive and alluring, and it fits one of the words in Akkadian that are used for him as having chili, the sort of sexual allure or allure in general, the allurement of the body of the ruler that is alluring and is used then in Western advertising in ways that you see here. Now, there's an, another way to think about it, however. And that is why or Naram Sin's body was so perfect and so beautiful. Notice that he's wearing a helmet with horns. And those horns are often associated with divine figures rather than with secular figures or rulers in general. It also happens to coincide with the addition of the writing of the name of Naram Sin or Naram Suen with the determinative in Akkadian or Sumerian for deity, which is Dingir, so that the Dingir sign precedes the writing of his name. And for him and his then son and heir, it was as if he were being elevated to a point at which he was considered to be part of not a god himself necessarily in worship. There I would contest some of my colleagues, but definitely participating in the divine through the perfection of his body and the perfection of his person in order to merit being the ruler of this complex polity that is the Akkadian period in Lower and Middle Mesopotamia. Now, for that reason, I put him next to a clay plaque where you see such a divine or heroic figure with a similar stance and a similar body, so that you can see that what is being used for Naram Sin is a unique event in the history of our history up to this point, and that is modeling his body after figures that are in contact with the divine, and therefore making sure that visually he's as alluring as the gods have made him in order to be a leader. There's another reason why the stela of Naram Sin is so popular in the Western survey and to Western eyes. And that is because we tend to privilege the upper field in many religious paintings through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and even on to more modern things. 
you're looking at the right now at a painting by Titian in Venice called The Assumption of the Virgin. It's an extraordinary painting, but I could have put in Michelangelo's Last Judgment as well, and you would have seen the same composition. That is, the key figure is at the top of the image field, the pictorial field, whether it's Naren Sin or the Virgin here. And for Michelangelo's Last Judgment, though it's hard to read at a slide in distance, so I didn't include it, the people who are good and deemed good in the Last Judgment are good Christians who come at the right of Christ by Michelangelo, and the bad Christians are the ones who are falling down into hell, and they are at his left. So that here, too, what you see is largely good people, but they surround the Virgin because it wasn't the last day, the day of judgment. So if you imagine a picture of Jesus with his own soldiers or his army of the good, coming upward toward him in heaven, and the army of the bad falling down into whatever you want to call hell, then the compositional organization of the stela is so close to Western compositional models as to fall into our habits of viewing and make it comfortable for us to see us as a work of art. Now, therefore, one add, last thing I would add is how tall was the stela of, of Naram Sin? Previous works were of diorite or a variety of hard stones. Naram Sin stela, if I can get the pointer over there, is made of sandstone. And sandstone, when it is touched by water, is very friable. Wherever it must have stood, it broke off at the bottom. And I think it basically rotted at the bottom because it was sedimentary rock. At that point, I had my artist who helped with the reconstruction drawing put in not just the bottom register that one can see of heads here, but another register to elevate it even higher. And that's the point at which this was probably a crucial monument of its age, standing quite high in relationship to the height of a human being or its placement, even when it stood in Mesopotamia, because it was then taken as booty by this Elamite Elamite ruler some thousand years later. And if that is in fact the case, then it had to have been standing for several hundred years at least in order to still be there in the Mesopotamian locus before it was moved to the Iranian plateau. And when it was moved, it was put into the courtyard of the major deity of the Elamites and therefore, in Shushinak, and therefore the king who captured the monument was very proud and able to dedicate it to his deity as a symbol of his own victory. So these monuments could move, but they also had enormous power, otherwise it would have just been trashed and left on the ground and would not have been carried, imagine, without wheels, really, or motors, all the way from what I think is probably the city-state of Sipar to Susa. Now that brings us to where I want to spend the rest of the time that I have at my disposal. And that is the stila of an individual by the name of Ornama, as it's generally called, belonging to the third dynasty of Ur, or the Ur III period. This monument, as a reconstruction, stood for at least 50 years and more in the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. And as such, drawings were made of it because it was found in very fragmentary condition. Now I must say that I'm not one of the happy people uh, about the fact that the University Museum decided to dismantle the reconstruction and take it apart, but didn't have the money to pay for the next round of reconstruction. So it still sits for the last 10, 15 years in fragments. And I refuse to show the fragments. So I'm showing you the whole so that you can have a sense that it was and is a major monument of the ancient world at the end of the third millennium BC. Now what you see is what you get and that is a stela that works through the individual named Ornama who set up the dynasty of the third dynasty of Ur and whose history is a little bit obscure, but we know 
contributed to the building of the great ziggurat at Ur and at several other sites, and built, in fact, the whole of a major complex with a temple on top of the ziggurat and a variety of other palaces and residences at the period. I had the privilege of excavating near there six years ago, and actually our bedroom window looked right out on the ziggurat. So I made everybody get up at two o'clock in the morning and at one of the equinoxes to take oh, no, the solstice, the winter solstice, to see where the moon and the Venus star was placed. And every morning my roommate and I would open the shutters and say, yep, it's still there. And um, it was such a privilege that it still brings sort of tears to my eyes. But Onama inaugurated a major building program at Ur and at various other sacred cities, city-states, in the Mesopotamian domain. At Nippur, which was one of them and where the Oriental Institute had a major investment in um, excavating for a number of years, we get stamp bricks that are attributed to Ornama that tell us that he was the king of the locus or city-state of Ur, that he was the king of Sumer and Akkade, that he was the man who built the temple of Enlil, who was the primary deity at Nippur. These bricks then get built into the building, so there's never any accident about who was responsible for the construction of this particular temple and or at Ur and various other places. Now, in this building program, the trope of building on the part of the ruler is a formal, an old one. Going back to the earlier part of the early dynastic period, you have an individual named Ornanshe who carries a basket on his head, and that image stands for the construction process of carrying the mud from which the bricks are made that will then go into the construct. Ashurbanipal carries it through to the Neo-Assyrian period in the first millennium BC, again holding this basket on his head. But one of the things I find interesting is that he doesn't do that up in Assyria where he was the king of Assyria, he does it in Babylon. Why? Because he's talking to a southern Mesopotamian audience for whom this is a trope of rulership that has to do with pious construction. So the piety of construction is a crucial advertising gimmick, if you will, but advertising point for the devoted of a ruler who gives to the people within their religious tradition. Now, at the same time, both Ornama and his son, Shogi, put building foundation figurines into boxes sometimes within the walls of the temples they help construct. So Ornama very nicely can, writes his inscription on it, Ornama around the side, who's the king that I just read you with his titles as king, and carries that, that basket on his head, just as his son Shogi um, does a similar thing carrying such a basket, and was actually wrapped in cloth as if he were being um, dressed for um, eternity and put into a box within the wall. Not only that, but the figure that has been associated with Ornama on the stela is depicted in the second, third register down on the front, wearing that rounded cap that is typical of rulers and carrying a basket over her shoulder with an ax and an as and various building equipment that suggests that he is being depicted as setting out to do the pious building that's associated with royal projects and royal engagements. Now, let me show you then where this whole fragment with Ornama, a deity and a servant, fits onto the stela called Ornama in that second register, third register down. This is all we've got. Then just below, oop, hang on, let me go back. We've got a brick wall, more brick wall, figures that seem to be carrying baskets on their head, and ladders. The major reconstruction of this stela was done in 1982 by a German scholar, as you see it here, and the person responsible for taking the stela apart into fragments to reconstruct it did a drawing first with a reinterpretation. I will dismantle that reinterpretation gently if I possibly can, but I do not believe at all in what she has depicted in her reconstruct, which is that Ornama, maybe, and servant, certainly, are standing behind a seated ruler 
all of whom face to your left. Now, why do I not believe it? Well, take a look. For one thing, when deities are depicted on cylinder seals in the Mesopotamian repertoire, they never have people standing behind them unless it is a servant subsidiary deity to the god who's seated and enthroned, because that's the point at which the cluster shows the deity receiving through a tutelary goddess the individual who's brought to the deity for blessing, for approval, for the return of a wish, for whatever comes through an audience with the god. Therefore, I do not believe that the deity, assuming that it's Nana, the moon god, could in any way, shape, or form be seated with Ornana standing behind him. He must be walking so that Ornana follows him precisely because the deity in his benevolent beneficence brings Ornama to the point at which he's been given the permission to build the new ziggurat and temple. Now that's why I care more for the reconstruction done by the German colleague than I do for my American colleague who worked at Penn, or worked through Penn. Now, it's another interesting fact that almost everybody looking at Mesopotamia knows a good deal about Gudea of Lagash because those sculptures with his folded hands have intrigued people since they were found in the early part of the 20th century as well. But Gudea exists not only in his statuary, he also exists in stile as well. And with recent chronological work, it turns out that Gudea and Ornama were probably very much close to, if not actual, contemporaries in the beginning of the 2100, 2110 BCE. What's interesting for my purposes is that flowing water and the introduction of the ruler are all part of Gudea iconography, as is the ladder and people walking with possible baskets or construction elements in their heads and in their, on, in their arms, such that one sees a repertoire of royal construction in the Earth Week period toward the end of the third millennium that is con contemporary and that is congruent with this notion of the ruler as a pious representative to the gods of the people and the state that he governs. Now that's another way of also talking about what's going on on the front of the Ornama Stila and then on the back, what in art history language is called the obverse and the reverse. Because what you see on the reverse are a couple of fragments of how shall I say, ritual performance, possibly to a statue of a king-like looking figure, drums that we know happened in ritual performance, rituals that were engaged in washing and possibly caring for divine images established in the temple, and then a scene we've never fully understood that takes place in the reed marshes with animals being slaughtered and the plants here. But I mention it to you precisely because there is a whole tradition of Ornama connected to Gudea that's found in this same vocabulary, not only in the building scene on an obverse, but on the ritual scenes of Gudea with the drums and variety of things being performed as part of temple worship. And here's what I'm coming to. There are two crucially important textual pieces of evidence about Gudea's building projects, known as Cylinder A and Cylinder B. You see them on your right. What we found is that Cylinder A focuses on Gudea spending the night in the temple, then going to do the construction of the temple that he is the donor of, and bringing the gods who are constructed and animated and brought into worship into the temple. Cylinder B then talks about what happens in the temple once the god is installed. And suddenly, putting this lecture together, which is the serendipity of putting things together and talking out loud, what I realized was, hey, wait a minute, the front, if it's part of building, then coming the ruler before 
the sun god, who's identifiable by the sun disk at the top of his crown and his consort, and then identifying the moon god, who is the god at Ur, Nana Suen, by the moon crescent, that what we're going through is the process of construction, bringing into the temple, and activating the deity as image inside the temple, just like Gudea Cylinder A. And then what we see is ritual being performed as renewal of the imagery in the temple, and that has to do with Cylinder B and the afterlife of the temple once it's consecrated and becomes an active institution. Now, take me on about this, colleagues, whatever you think, but I was kind of excited by making that connection. Now, here's where I have a real problem then with some of the reconstruction. The sun god is here, and you see him with his sun disc in his headdress crown, divine crown. I am persuaded that the moon god is up top with the crescent moon here, but something funny is going on. And in the time that, that uh, I have, I want to take you through that so you can see why I've chosen these three monuments to present to you. What you see are a tiny pair of feet. See them? Toes curling down and a foot, and a part of another foot. Not unlike the feet of the deity. Um, and something or somebody is sitting on the lap of the moon god. Now, again, the scholar with whom I tend to not agree said that these feet and those were pretty much the same, and that these feet were that of an adult, and therefore, using a clay plaque from Gudea's site of Lagash, reconstructed those feet as belonging to the consort of the moon god, and therefore his beloved lady, and sitting on the god's lap. Now, I had a, when I lived in International House, I had a Basque friend on my corridor whose grandmother only spoke Basque and learned a few words of English, including the phrase, I don't believe it. And so this grandmother would always say, I don't live it. <laughs> and I don't live it means I don't believe it. And I don't believe it precisely because this is a perfectly fine trope for devotional pieces that don't necessarily exist across a whole register where something had to have been on the other side too, even if it's missing, and probably ought to be the consort of the moon god, just as it was the consort of the sun god in that place. I therefore would argue that there's a better way to think about it. And this goes back to a dissertation written here at the Oriental Institute in 1959 by a woman who then dropped out of the field. But it was based on her mentor's work, Torquil Jakobsen, one of, again, my first teachers when I came to the Institute in 1961, who had published a crucial article in the discourse about state development that's been built upon, changed in many ways since the time. But Jakobsen's article in 1952 cited a text that talked about the God's reward to Ornama for his piety. They ensure his royal line by giving him a son born of the Entu, the priestess of the moon god of Nana in Nippur. Now, as far as I'm concerned, ladies and gentlemen, suddenly the penny dropped what if this wasn't the Ornama Stele at all? Because we don't have an inscription from the front that says, I am Ornama and I am doing this. It's, we have only two places in which the possibility of Ornama is named, and it's not a clear and lengthy enough description to talk about ownership and identity. Consequently, if those feet are not the feet of the lady consort of the moon god, who could they be? But the sun and air promised to Ornama in return for his pious act of building the temple. And what you see at the top then of the stela is the god Nana proferring, if not the concept at least, or the real, the possibility of the sun and air, Ashogi, who then takes on from his father after a brief 12 years of reign, and then goes on to who are my worst three colleagues? 40 years or something of ruling southern and then extended territories of Mesopotamia in ways that had never been achieved before. Now, if we move forward with that hypothesis, it makes the whole monument come clearer in ways that 
it has, to my mind, not been clear before. From the building, with a figure, putatively or nana, who then performs ritual acts in front of the sun god and his consort, and the moon god with the feet on his lap. That's the point at which, if you can read it in a different way, the moon god then, and his consort opposite, would prefer as not a reward, but a pious gift of reciprocity, a son and heir to Ornama. And then the question comes, who built the stilo? We certainly know that the heir, or the son, or the crown prince, is an important part of the iconography of the later Neo-Assyrian polity, when Sargon of Agade at Khorsabad shows who we think is the son and heir Sennacherib, who I believe built Khorsabad, in various different moments in front of a divine figure or in front of the king. But I don't think we can necessarily assume that the iconography is the same 1,500 years later as it was in the Ur III period, so we have to take that with a grain of salt. I leave you with three hypotheses. One, and that's why I put it in quotes from the beginning, that the stila was in fact constructed by Ornama in his reign to commemorate his own deeds and to talk about how pleased he was to have this son and heir. Perfectly possible, we don't know yet. But another scenario reads that the stela was constructed by his son Shulgi, who succeeded him, and finished the building of the ziggurat at Ur, which his father did not complete, and constructed the monument as well, in honor of his father, showing the work that had been initiated by Ornama. Now there's a third hypothesis as well, and that is that the stela was constructed by Shulgi as if by and of Ornama, but in fact, and here's the undercurrent that's politically in Shulgi's interest, in fact constructed by Shulgi as part of Shulgi's own political narrative in order to legitimize himself as the son and heir of Ornama, and therefore one could expand the title from Ornama Stili to Shulgi's Ornama Stila because it represents, I think, one of the first times in history that we can document a rhetorical use of imagery and monument and monumentality for political purposes that serve the ends of the donor patron, but don't necessarily represent everything as was the case so much as what wants to be emphasized in the subsequent rule. Now, it's going to take a while to sort this out, but unless you put three hypotheses out there and annihilate competing hypotheses, then you don't seek for evidence that could help you have a favored as opposed to a less favorable conclusion of which one you would prefer with real data rather than choosing one hypothesis over another. So I present that to you, and I have no idea where I'm going to take it or where somebody else will take it. What I want you to keep in mind is that monuments reflecting rulers are sometimes made post hoc, sometimes during the reign of, but continue then in a trajectory right through Rome, let's say to the Column of Trajan, where Column's campaigns against the Dacians in the north of Italy um, become a major part of his iconographic program, and that rulers we take for granted have introduced this iconographic program in support of the state and state organization right through to the modern day. Think of the monument of Vittorio Emanuele in, in Rome, not just the Trajan column. And consequently, we are kind of jaded. We don't see the beginning of the sequence as something so important that it marked a crucial <coughs> moment of marking the rule, marking royalty, marking the state, and marking the political fabric, because we've got now, what, 4,000 years of a consequential sequence. It's also the case that remember what Rome did with big public monuments, like the various triumphal arches that many of you will have visited or seen pictures of. Now, what you may know of the Arch of Titus is that inside, on this wall here, is a scene that is thought to be the dismantling of the temple in Jerusalem, the second destruction of the temple, and consequently observing Jews refuse to walk through it because it celebrates the, the 
looting of the goods from the temple, including the menorah from Jerusalem. What I want you to look at is the inner arch, which the shape should remind you of something. It's a steely in absentia, in a way, so that this public monument becomes what people actually walk through as a public monument in a public space. And that, too, becomes a way of marking celebration and, in fact, ceremonial performance right through to the liberation of Paris and the Arc de Triomphe in 1944. Now, I want to emphasize that that is not what I'm talking about. Because I'm not talking about something that's out there in the city that people interact with on their way to the market in their automobiles or their chariots on a day-to-day -day basis. I also bet you that even in Rome, people might have swarmed around the triumphal arches, but they didn't march through ceremonially unless there was something to celebrate, which was Titus's victory or whoever's victory over whatever. So if the stela was a public monument, I want you to think about what public it was addressing, and what the archaeological fine spots might have been of the fragments we do have. Now, in the first place, the stela of Ornano. Fragments of it were found in the sacred precinct of the ziggurat to the moon god. However, it was found in levels associated with the Kassite period in the second half of the, um, of the second millennium, not the third. That means a long period afterward. Again, like Naram Sin, it's conceivable that that stela stood for a long time. But it was also found in fragments distributed around a fairly wide area. Consequently, it's not clear how long it lasted before it was smashed or when it was smashed. And that's part of our problem in interpretation. Was it smashed by the Kassites? Was it smashed after the Kassites by somebody else coming through? We don't know. I don't know. And consequently, what we do know is that being in that sacred precinct, it was probably associated somehow with the building activity finished in the ziggurat and depicted on the stela. Therefore, I would argue that the Ornama stela is in fact a shogi stela, possibly, in the name of Ornama. But it resurrects some of the issues raised by the stele of the vultures, by having put the god on the front of the stele and the king's role in narrative in battle on the back. And here, it's the king's role before the gods again that was not made explicit on the stele of Naram Sin. What was made explicit here was one's face only, and it's the king's triumphal rise to a victory in the battle against these Gutians. I think that this is, in reality, a crucial monument about the massaging of a public toward royal rhetoric. And the royal rhetoric that's being introduced has to go back to the people and religion by Sumerians in the Urthri period. And that is that piety is a crucial measure of the favor of the gods for the reward of a son and heir and for the success of the state. So that if anything, the in many ways, the stela of Naram Sin was not a success. Nothing replicated again in the continual sequence from Mesopotamia. We go from the stele of the vultures to Naram Sin, and from Naram Sin to Ornama, or Shulgi's Ornama, hearkening back to another way of talking about the relationship between the state and the religious factor of um, of what would you call it, of dominion by the grace of the gods rather than dominion by the power of the individual. So that the monument depicting that grace of the gods becomes a continuous message that's repeated and recursive um, throughout the sequence of a particular ruler. Now this is the point at which I also would argue that the Urthri period was doing something that hadn't been done before. Also, that is to say that the state introduced what we would call, in social terms, a four-tiered, not a three-tiered hierarchy. That is, the kings, like Naram Sin, who didn't succeed because the Akkadian dynasty imploded, 
added the personal name of himself with the divine determinative Dingir in front of his name, and he then was supported by the local rulers of the city-states that had formerly been autonomous and the territories that were, in effect, um, accrued to the Mesopotamian polity, all of whom had had autonomous leaders in the past, in the earlier part of the third millennium, but now had to be superseded by central authority through the ruler at Ur. They therefore had to go from, let me see if I can get this, a three-tiered hierarchy of the people, officials, and local rulers to the central power, which was the king, and therefore the name of the king gets deified, but Ornama did not take on that Digir component, the deified marker. It's Shulgi, his son, who took it on and retrojected it back to his father, which I think is another piece of the evidence of Shulgi being active in the situation of his father as part of the whole state that Shulgi went on to develop. Now, I've got a hypothesis with evidence that seems to be supported. I don't have proof, but to my mind, it's something worth pursuing. That leads me to my closure, which has to do with iconoclasm. Whether the stela of Ornamu was smashed on purpose or just like the stela of, Nar of Naram Sin, possibly decaying through moisture, rising up through sedimentary sandstone, we'll have no way to know. But we have seen terrible acts of iconoclasm in recent times, wrought by ISIS, wrought by a variety of ways and places. At times, it has been the case that other religions become the target at times of iconoclasm, as in France and various other places with the Reformation and Martin Luther and then the Counter-Reformation, so that we've known iconoclasm in our Western trajectory as well. In this case, something new has been added, which is that it may not only be against the ancient gods of Mesopotamia that Isis has been operating, but also against the West that reveres that history as a pre-Islamic trajectory that they choose to not develop. And so, therefore, the destruction may have a lot to do with us, not just them. At the same time, I want to remind you that at every regime change, there is also often a point at which images are pulled down, distracted, destroyed, purposely smashed, or symbolically decapitated. Whether it was Stalin and Lenin early on, whether it was the Shah of Iran in 79, whether it was Saddam in, 2000, in what, 1991, 2003, we have seen in our time, images that have been pulled down because they represent a rhetoric that is anathema to the current population. And this is a tradition that goes on in China with every dynastic change too. We revere the old stuff, but very often the next dynasty does not revere what the prior dynasty has put up. In fact, it needs to destroy that ground in order to build its own ground. So that's what brings me to the stila of Shulgi's stila of Ornama as one of the more interesting markers in the development of monuments in the early days of monuments um, as we have seen them. And this is, of course, my close, because precisely what we're looking at is a sequence from a religious temple orientation to a political hierarchy in the early dynastic period of the divine on the front of the monument, but the king maneuvering and inserting himself to a place that's crucial on the back, which means it should have been visible from the back as well, to Ornama, I mean to Naram Sin, who has the presumption to wear these divine horns, if that's what he's doing, and to invoke the deity, presumably of Sippar, but certainly Babylonian important deity, but really not make a god, a player, on the one side of his stila, and then coming back to renewing the double-sidedness of the shulgi, or nama stila, of the construction of the temple with the building and the worshiping and the devotion and the reward, which then on the back deals with the calendar of ritual observance, of renewal and ritual that goes on inside the temple. So I think that all three of them together make a very important 
statement that any one of them dealing with time, place, or iconography does not make alone. And that's what I would leave you with, that the typology of stila needs to be considered as a category so that we move from the city-state to, I think, what I would call a nation-state, to not an empire. I'm alone in not wanting to call Orsri an empire, but a territorial state, for, but we can argue that at another time, through the public sphere of monuments, whether or not they're out there in the street, it is not a secular phenomenon, but we move from God to king to divine kings in order to sustain the rhetoric of polity through the imagery that's presented to the deity, to themselves, and to a wider public. And what that means is that these are not secular monuments, but they also are not totally out there in the public. I want to emphasize the significance of material culture in working out the nature of the state and the nature of the culture. I want to emphasize by extension the physical material materiality of the ideology as it's put into images for a non-literate public so that you have this imagery from which the informed could read the nature of the state, the nature of the ruler, the nature of rule, the nature of the polity through devotional imagery that the stila represents as a very special category of monument. Thank you. We're done.